morning. Welcome, welcome. I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did. It is truly a blessing to have a worship team that knows how to follow God's lead. So today, this morning, I, uh, I just feel like I got something I've been sitting with and praying on and just asking the Lord, like, what just what's, you know, what does he want to say? Because, um, pr- man, pride will just get you. It'll wipe you off track so fast and you don't even realize sometimes that it's happening. Uh, I am such a big advocate for mentors and for having leaders who can speak truth to you, uh, for having people who can help you hold, you know, hold you accountable. Uh, sometimes I, I remember, I feel like I had days where the only things that I did right was I showed up to church, you know, and I called, called the person that, you know, got to speak into my life and spoke to him, you know, and like just sometimes those simple things, man, will push you right back on track, you know, it, 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 like a light bulb will go on, you, the pride will get exposed, you know, and you can repent and get back on track. Uh, so I have a word today, I really just believe it's just something that the last couple of years has just been brewing and it's been getting louder, at least just in my own personal prayer life. And, and I want to talk about bringing the Lord an offering that's worth something, that costs something, that has value. Um, you know, the type of offering where it's like, you know, you didn't just have a $20 bill in your pocket that you forgot about, so you put it in the collection plate. You know, the type of offering that says, I love you, and I'm yours, and I will do what you say to do because I'm in love with you, and you're a good leader. That's the offering that I'm talking about, right? And so just please understand that, like, there's this, there's this quote. Um, it's Eugene Peterson. But he, he says, the task of a prophet is not to smooth things over, but to make things right. And I just feel like it's so easy to be offended. It's so e- it's easier to be offended than it is to actually like push in and get to the other side of it. It's way easier to just have a hard heart, discredit whatever you disagree with, and, you know, take a step back and, and, set, you know, and go your own way. It really is. It really is. It, 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 I'm reminded of Luke 7 and Jesus said, blessed are, blessed are you who's not offended by my words. Right? And I know, I know that that's not popular. I know that, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I don't look at my wife and I'm like, hey, baby, I love you. Could you... What are you doing right now? Do, will you just, can you give me something stern real fast just to jive in it up and make it difficult today? You know, like, just be honest about it. Like, no, like I don't intentionally wake up and hope that, like, you know, things are going to be extra tough and I'm going to have to, like, wrestle with my flesh, right? I, I, but but here's, here's what I believe. I believe that there are warning flags that will go off and, and, when you feel maybe the tension arise between what you think in your flesh, how you feel in your body, and choosing to like allow God to walk you through that and lead you and teach you that when you get on the other side of it is, eventually you will align yourself with what he has to say with whatever the situation is. And when you do, you can actually look back and point to things and say, wow, look, God did that. God did that. Oh, look at how, look at what I was thinking. I actually believed that. And now the Lord has like redeemed this thought, this thought pattern in my ha- my life, whatever it is, right? And so I, I just want to encourage you that I'm going to read some scripture today and it may rough, like ruffle your feathers a little bit and cause you to like look inward and spend time with the Lord. And that's exactly what I want to do. <laughs> so, so just know that like, my intention is to bring something to you that I believe because there's no ceiling with God. There's no ceiling. I don't care if you're not saved now, if you got saved last Wednesday, if you've been saved for a hundred years, it doesn't matter to me. I'll respect 
that guy who's been safe forever. But what I am saying is we can't just pretend like there's a cap to how good or smart or wise God is because that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And I want to be 80 years old sitting on the floor, like still in awe of the fact that like there is more for God to show me. There's more for him to point out in me. There is more levels of goodness for me to see. Like it doesn't end. And so the picture that I'm painting is no matter how well you, you know, do or do, the person in the world, if we could find them who knows God the most, We could multiply it by a thousand, and when you get to heaven and see him for who he is, it will not even scratch the surface of what, how good we think he is, or how much he loves us. It won't. It won't. So I'm just, we're just going to remove the ceiling and just look at him today because there's more, and that's what I want to call out on you. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, the Bible says that pride will come before the fall or destruction, which are like, that is rough to chew on. Um, But the humble one wins. The humble one wins. So I'm just going to press forward and believe that God knows something that I don't. And that, you know, when I get to the other side of whatever season, whatever tension that is, that I'm going to grow, I'm going to look more like him, and I'm going to be generous like he is. I will have something in my hand that I can give to the next person. Because if everybody, like generosity is a value of the kingdom, if you were stingy, the gospel wouldn't spread. It wouldn't make it past that door, <laughs> right? God so loved the world that he gave his son. So that's what I'm going to do. I've been praying, chewing on the word, and getting before God, and I'm going to give you a word today. So here's a little backstory in that. Uh, I'm going to look at Malachi, and I want to just set up like just a historical view so you have some kind of idea so it's not like God's just randomly speaking and we don't know uh, what's happening. So the Israelites went into captivity. They were in Babylon, 70 years, okay? And so they had three main waves of being released back to their homeland, right? So they got, they got sent home. Uh, and so most of you probably know that story. Um, if, you, if you don't, Uh, come find me after service. I can point you to some scriptures of it. But really, it's like Nehemiah, Ezra. You know, those are the chapters where you really start to see people returning. Uh, And so, one of the interesting things that happens is there are three prophets who are like post-exile prophets, right? So, like, they are prophets to the people after they have been, like, released. And one of them is Malachi. And by the time that Malachi comes on the scene, the wall has been rebuilt around the city. The altar and the temple have both been rebuilt and restored. Okay, And so they had started having their festivals again. They had the priests in order to give like the daily sacrifices according to the law of Moses. Like they, so they were doing the things. They were doing the things. And so I, what, I, what I really want you to see is in modern day for you as a Westerner, right? They, they hit every small group. They showed up every Sunday and they tithed. And so they did all the things, checked all the boxes. All the boxes were good. However, the biggest problem is, is that the rest of their life just kind of carried on as normal. They just carried on as normal. So there wasn't this internal change. So we've got offerings and sacrifices and we're like doing the stuff and the rest of my regular day life is exactly the same. Okay, so just whatever that means to you, picture that. You leave here and go do the thing, right? And so what makes it even more tricky is that like the Lord's hand was still on the people. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like sometimes... Things will happen in your life, and you can see God's hand. And so it's really obvious. So in this case, when, when they got returned to their homeland, there were still other types of people groups that lived there, right? It wasn't just like this boarded off, like we've saved it for you so nobody else lives there kind of a deal. There were other groups intermingled. And so repeatedly, the people in charge of those areas would would petition the kings of Persia who oversaw the whole land and they would try to get, you know, the building of the temple stopped. They would try to get the building of the 
uh, altar stopped, right? And, and, and time and time again, you would see the Lord, you know, nudge the king that was in charge of Persia and would be like, hey, tell those governors of those regions that my people or that God's people are going to finish this. Actually, I want you to give them wood and money to pay for it, right? And so it's like you saw this pattern of the Lord just stepping in and flexing his muscle and allowing his people to do something. The problem with that is if you're not careful, you will recognize the hand of the Lord and the things that you're doing in a proud state. And so then, you know, when you step before him to give him an offering, you're familiar with him and it has no value. Right, so so this, so here's Malachi who steps in, right? And so just I want I want I just want for you to grasp like the like how serious of a word this is because it, it's you know I was talking I think I was talking to Paul or one of you guys before service about how every day before Jesus returns, right, is just going to be a little bit darker. Holy Spirit is going to outpour. We are going to see signs and miracles and wonders like we have never seen before. But we can't pretend like it just comes in a package with no other stuff around. Like it's not in a, you know, terrarium. Like you're still here. There's still darkness rising, right? And so like I want to call you today before it's six years from now that if there's that thing in your hand to let go, just to let go, just to like, if you came today, like, this is rhetorical, so don't answer me out loud. But when you came today, did you bring the Lord a gift? Did you bring him something of value? What did you bring for the great king today? Like, like honestly, just... Go home and ponder that. What did I come? Is it just Sunday's church day and that's what we do? Because when the rest of the world starts shouting all kinds of stuff about your king, you're going to have nothing to stand on. We need skin in the game as believers. And that's the very thing that will help us look more like him. So when your neighbor says stuff, you can you know, actually display God's heart for them because you'll know him more. So, Malachi, okay, jumps on the sing, jumps on the scene, let's do it. Malachi 1, uh, verse 10, this is Malachi speaking on behalf of the Lord. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. And you go down a couple verses to 14. He says, but cursed be the deceiver who takes in his flock a male, takes a vow and sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord. I just want you to feel that this morning. I am a great king. I am a great king. I just, I, I can't help but just sit there and reevaluate the decisions of my day, right? Like, if I'm being honest, there are times where pride definitely gets the best of me and I have to like go back and repent. I have to go back and like double check the way that I'm living, right? And it's sneaky. It, it, it's, not, it's not something that will just fall in your lap and you're like, oh, I'm being proud. Like, no, proud people usually don't know they're proud. <laughs> That's the problem with being proud, right? Uh, so, so I'm just going to throw that at you. Uh, I, I just feel the weight of that this morning. And I think the last couple of years that the Lord has really just been knocking out things that have no weight or merit in the kingdom, right? And, and, and so we should shift. We should reevaluate. <laughs> we, we should. We should be constantly striving to grow in our knowledge of the Lord. It makes me think about Job. Job is a man that the Lord saw as sinless. Right? He was blameless before the Lord. And read the book of Job. If, you, you know, if this is something that pricks you, I want you to go home and read it. I don't have time to just dive into the whole thing. But I want to give you just a quick, just a quick nugget. Job has three friends. 
God allows the devil to mistreat him, and his three friends come, and they give him awful advice. And they're not viewing God correctly. Right? And Elihu is this younger guy who basically just sits there and lets the older people finish talking. <laughs> and then after they're done, Elihu gets to come and speak some words, right? And, and, and so he basically, I'll paraphrase, he says, hey, are you guys done? I want to respect you because you're elders. I don't want to like hurt your feelings. So if you're finished, allow me to proceed and give my two cents. And what I want to point out is that Elihu, people try to dismiss what he says and I'm going to show you some verses in a second where we actually see the way that Elihu opens up is exactly the same way that God responds. And so I believe that when Elihu comes to speak, I believe that he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. I believe he's being prophetical. Um, and And I just want to say, can we please not be a people who dismiss something that is uncomfortable, unfamiliar, or something that we don't know? I'll give you a really good example. Um, I am not 20. I have finally reached a point in my life where I look at the 18, 17, 16 year old kids and I hear the way that they talk and I'm like, man, what does that mean? And I have to Google like what the phrases are that they say, because I don't know. I don't know what you're saying anymore. All of this new music is terrible. Like, why is it so loud in here? It's awful. I hate it. Take me back to 2003 when I was, you know, prime. And, <laughs> and so, so for a really long time, you know, as, you know, gradually it was like, okay, I'm 24, 30, 30 you know, I'm 36 now. And I've hit that point where I don't understand like the people behind me necessarily. And I want to, in the natural, just dismiss it completely because I don't get it. I just want to dismiss it. Right? I, I, I don't understand 19-year-old text speak, and it's weird, and I don't like it. And so it's easier, if I'm being honest, to just be like, Pfft. You know, I'll talk to you when you grow up or like whatever, right? And so like, just insert the thing because I promise there are things that are like uncomfortable to you or like you don't get it. And it's, it's way easier to just be like, I don't get that and to like go about your business because like we all have stuff to do, right? Everybody has stuff, right? But I just cannot get away from the fact that like those kids are the very, very same people that we are supposed to be pouring into. The very same people that we are supposed to be raising up and showing that we love the Lord. If you thought it was confusing when you were a teenager, imagine what it's like now. So I'm so convicted, I'm so convicted that like, anytime I feel myself dismissing dismissing something because I don't get it, I just feel the Lord like, hey, just look at me for a second before you look at that. And let's look at it together. And I want you to get my heart, you know, for that 14-year-old <laughs> who you don't understand, you know. So Elihu is this young guy. And so he's basically like, hey, I know you guys don't, you know, you guys are older and whatever. And, you know, you're supposed to be wiser than me. But I'm going to throw my two cents in. So I'm going to put my hat on the court. And so Elihu, he starts to speak in 35, Job 35, 16. And, and he goes, there, this is Elihu speaking. He says, therefore, Job opens his mouth in vain and he multiplies words without knowledge. And in 38, we see God start to speak. And God says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? And so I just want to suggest, can we not just dismiss this whole thing because I believe that he was just in the vein with how God was thinking and feeling, right? And I think that sometimes the, you know, I felt it during worship this morning, like the, the curtain between heaven and earth just gets thin. And for like a brief moment, we just feel and see the way that God does, right? You just get a little, just a little, just a little taste of what's to come. And, and, I, and so I just think that Elihu was having this moment. And you go forward the next chapter and Elihu, he says in 36, 26, Behold, God is great, 
and we do not know him. And I just, I just want you to feel the weight of that this morning. Like, maybe you don't know him 100% of the way that there is to know God. <laughs> maybe there's more. Maybe there's more. I do not have it all figured out. You guys, it's probably especially hard because I spend most of the time in this role where I'm like, a pastor guy who, when I meet with people, I'm like the person who's pastor. So the majority of the time, I'm in that role of like, I'm, a, I'm speaking mentor talk, or I'm like holding you accountable, or like, just naturally, that's kind of like the place where the conversation goes, where I'm the one like giving advice. And it's a dangerous, dangerous place for me to get to a spot where it's like, I'm always giving advice, and if I'm not careful, all of a sudden, I've got him figured out. And so now I'm just writing church programs and, and worship was just a little too long today. So like, heaven forbid, that last 10 minutes, somebody gets set free from whatever it is. You know, you came in, maybe you came in and had no gift. And in the last 10 minutes, the Lord was like, hey, I'd like your checkbook. <laughs> I'm just saying, maybe we don't have it all figured out. Right? Maybe we don't have it all figured out. And, and so I just want to like just throw that into the ring, like put some weight on that, that like, man, he is unsearchable. You can get before him any day, any time, for any length of time, and he can show you things that will knock your socks off. I don't want to be bored ever. I don't want to be familiar ever. I don't want to be so happy that, you know, we're out of captivity and the temple's built and we're doing sacrifice. The prayer team's got it. Prayer team's got it. I, I, I know that, like, God wants to know me, but, like, I tithed and I, I put it on the prayer chain, so, like, I'm good, and now I'm just going to go hang out on Tuesday because Tuesday night's game night. Like, no! There's so much more. And I want to call, I want you to just peek through the veil, and see God. Jesus is sitting on a throne right now, intercession, like praying for you, like tap into that. This should never be boring. Are you kidding? We get to come together and do this freely, freely. Worship was so awesome this morning, and we get to do that. I get to do that twice a week if I'm lucky. <laughs> I rotate Wednesdays, so maybe I'll see you. Psalm 145, I, I'm just, I've just been praying this psalm over and over. It's verse 3. Look at the sentence. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Does that mean don't search? No. <laughs> it means you won't get bored. It means he knows you more than you believe. It means he is greater and better than you could ever possibly imagine. And if you were to give him the time, you would never get bored. And so I, I've said it before, if our idea of God, it stops at our knowledge, then he's not God, our knowledge is. If our idea of God stops where we feel comfortable, he's not God, anxiety is. If our idea of God stops at the way he's worked before, then he's not God, how we view history with him is. And I just want to say that, like, we have more time to get to know him. <laughs> we have more time to get to know him. And I want to see every person walk in the fullness of their calling. I want to see, I, 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 want, to, I want to get lunch with somebody. And before I have the chance to say, hey, what is the Lord doing in your life right now? Before I even have the chance to ask, we'll sit down and you'll be like, dude, I got to tell you a story. I got to tell you a story. Okay, do you remember that thing I was saying? I was praying, you'll never guess what the Lord will do. And I, and I don't because he's greater than I, I know. I could, I could take a guess, but I bet it's better than what I'm thinking. <laughs> and so, so that, that's the heart. Look, look at Isaiah 62, 66. Maybe you're supposed to read 62. That's not on my notes. Look at 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things, my hand is made and all those things exist says the Lord, but on this one I will look. On him who is poor 
and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. When was the last time you trembled at his word? When was the last time that you opened the Bible and read what he had to say and just wept at it? One of my earliest memories of church, I'll never forget it. It's interesting how people will follow the Lord like very on track, like 90%, right? Like we're going to be very, you know, we'll hold fast in all these areas. And like sometimes there's that one thing where we'll compromise, is that just, that's just me? I'm the only one who comes Okay, cool. So that's you guys too. Okay, it's just interesting. And I remember I left the church, came back, had a wild year. And, and I just like found my footing again. And there was this girl I started dating and it was total compromise, 100%. And I tried to make it okay in every other way possible. And like the rest of my life, I was living and really like pursuing the Lord. And there was this, just this one, there was this one thing. And I like just wasn't ready to let it go. Or maybe, you know, I had no Malachi who was like, (laughs) your offerings are pointless, right? I don't know what it was, but I remember this guy came up to me and gave me this word. And I went home and I read John 15 and I wept. Just ugly cry. The ugliest cry you've ever. Just <laughs> the, my, my pages of my Bible are still, like they're still marked up. But you know when it changed? It changed on that day. Yeah. That was the day where finally the Lord broke through, you know, the hardness of heart that I had and he got me. And man, I'm telling you, my wife is the best. Thank goodness that that didn't work out. You know, like for real. And, and, so, and so I'm just saying like, when's the last time that we read his word and trembled before him and we're like, yo, you are actually right. And I don't understand it. I'm not asking you to be the person who understands everything that you read, but I am asking you to be the person who trusts that what you're reading is true. First Samuel 15, this isn't a new thought. This isn't the, the idea of bringing an offering that costs you something is not a new idea. First uh, Samuel 15, 22, it says, So Samuel said, Has the Lord any delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed the fat of rams. Hosea 6, 6, 6, he says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Jesus touched this in the New Testament in Matthew 9. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's good news. That's good news for us. To know God is to love God. And to love God is to be obedient. Obedience is love at the highest level. And so I'm just saying we need to define love the way that God does. We need to view God the way that he asked us to view him. Luke 9, it says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory. The Israelites... They weren't obedient because they didn't love them. And so here's what I want to do. I want to show you a better way. I want to give you a chance to respond. I want to just point out that there's more, that there's more, and it's okay. Humility wins. 
So like the way that you win is by being like, hey, you know what? That, that crazy guy up there is on to something. I actually think that there is more to God than I know. If you think about the Beatitudes, right? We, I want it to be this neat, clean prayer where I'm like, you know, oh, Lord, <laughs> you're good, and it's neat and pretty and whatever. And, like, when I, read, when I read through the Beatitudes, you see Matthew 5. Blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> I skipped a verse. For they shall be comforted. I, I just read through these. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. I just feel blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You guys know these scriptures, right? I just feel like the Lord is like, come to me in honesty and humility and spend time with me, right? And, and it's crazy because like the things that you choose to do with your life matter to God. He's actually affected by the way that you live. It affects him. He has, uh, you know, it, it does something to him. He moves by it. And so I, I'm, reminded, I'm reminded of a verse. Uh, it's, it's when David's son, Solomon, is dedicating the temple. And it's kind of easy to skip past it if you, if you, if you read it like if you follow a reading plan and the chapters end, you know, you could be like, okay, cool, I read this today, and, you know, done, and then go watch your day. And then the next day, if you start in the next chapter, you could miss the, like, the transition, right? And so I, I'm going to read Second Chronicles 6 and Second Chronicles 7 together. And when I read this, I just, here, let's just read it. Second Chronicles 6, 42. This is Solomon praying, and he says, O oh Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. Next sentence. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And I'm just saying that I feel like when Solomon stood there and said, God, Remember, David, that there was something on that, and the Lord just, poof. just God responded. I want God to respond when people are like, hey, do you remember that JD guy? <laughs> yeah. I want to live a life where everything that I'm doing is honoring and pleasing to the Lord, right? And it's not this religious, like, oh, you're going to do everything right. No, 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 no. I'll do stuff wrong for sure. And then when I do, I'll come before him and he'll make it right. Yeah. So I want to go into worship again for a little bit. I promise I won't keep you forever. And I just want you to think about anything in your life where it's like, it, is, am, am I holding on to something? Is there something that I haven't let go of? Am I bringing offerings to the Lord that cost me something, right? And even like the way I view it, it it's a sacrificial praise because you cannot understand something about God. You can also read the Bible and in your flesh be like, man, I have a hard time. I don't know. I don't understand or whatever, right? Just pick the thing because I promise at one point or another, maybe not, but I've definitely read scripture where I read it and there's this conflict between like my flesh and my head and my knowledge and I find myself becoming my own God where I'm like trying to work out to make it make sense to me and, and you know, but I think that God just wants you to come and sit at his feet and talk to him. I think that he wants to renew your mind. I think that he wants you to bring him something that cost you something and, and watch him be God. So we're going to worship just for a little bit more. I want to pray over you. And I want to give you the opportunity 
to where if, if you showed up today and it was just kind of that day where like you rolled out of bed, hit the alarm, you showed up late, whatever, that you can hit the reset anytime. And you can come before the Lord anytime. And you can thank him. And if you have nothing else to give, you can thank him. If you're like, man, I got nothing else, you can look at him and thank you. And here's, and here's why I talk about pride so much, okay? Just hear, hear, hear what I'm saying. Don't fill in the gaps. Just hear what I'm saying and not what I'm not. It's so sneaky that we have to get before God to allow him to be leader of our life and point it out. Why? So my wife is a gift. Scripturally, she's a gift from God, right? And, and so if I'm not careful, there will be random rigmarole in our life. I don't even know if that's how you say that word, rigmarole, roar, roll, make a ball. <laughs> and, and there'll be tension, right? And just pick the thing, right? Like whatever, like maybe we just had words over dinner or I want a parent different or, you know, I want a card that's a stick shift and she wants a manual and so we're rah, fighting. It's a real thing. And so, <laughs> so there's tension, right? And I'm so quick to get before God and be like, hey, because the Bible says to make your petitions made known to him, right? And so I'm so quick to get before him and be like, fix it. This is making me mad and I'm upset. Change Sarah's mind. <laughs> Lord, I know I look like you, so it's obviously it's her fault or whatever, right? And, and so, and, and because like I said, right, like there's this part where most of the time when I meet with people, I'm like the, like the leader, pastor, dude or whatever. And it'd be really, really easy to like leave the accountability out of my life or whatever. And my prayer life would look like me just asking God to change people. And maybe, just maybe, God wants me to thank him and sit at his feet and let him remind me that she's actually a gift. That when she says no, he's blessing me. Have you thanked God for saying no lately? Like really, like, like I have no idea what's on the other side of that, but I do know that she hears from God and I do know that when she speaks from God, maybe she's heard him. I, I, I want to die to myself. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.